All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is the live session for uh, Module 2. Um, before we start getting into the Module 2 homework solution, we're going to go back and go through the uh, questions to the Module 1 quiz. So to start with, the first question says, the branches from a node of an event tree must be, and the solution to this first one here is going to be, all of the above. They must both be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So question number two, true or false, uh, event tree branches are conditional on all preceding pathways. And that's going to be true. So any event that comes before um, the branch in the event tree, we are to assume that is true when estimating the nodal probability of the next one. So they are definitely conditional on all preceding pathway events. So question three, probabilities along event tree pathways are, and that's going to be multiplied. So as you move along a pathway with an event tree, we're going to multiply the probabilities to get the um, probability at the end of it. And then question four, probabilities moving down across the vet tree branches are, those are going to be summed. So let's think about when you get to the end of your event tree and you have your end node probabilities. If you want to calculate the um, probability of failure, you take all the end nodes that result in failure and sum. And then the last question from the quiz, we've got events A, B, and C that are all independent events. Event A has a probability of 0.3. Event B has a probability of 0.6. And event C has a probability of 0.4. And we're asked for the probability of union for these events. So there's a couple different ways to answer this question. Um, the easiest is to use De Morgan's rule. And when we do that, we're going to get 0.832. So to use the Morgan's rule, we're going to take 1 minus the product of the complements. So that's going to be 1 minus the product of 1 minus the probability of A times 1 minus the probability of B times 1 minus the probability of C. And we'll get 0.832. Another way to do that is to go ahead and enumerate all the different possibilities. So when we do that, we think about it in a Venn diagram. The Venn diagram would look something like this. So to get the probability of union, we're going to take the probability of A, this top circle here, add to it the probability of B, and add to that the probability of event C. Now when we do that, we've overcounted, I guess, all the different places where it overlaps. So I'm counting this area where a and B come together twice. I'm counting where A and C come together twice, where B and C come together twice, and then I'm counting um, where A, B, and C come together um, three different times. So I'm going to have to subtract out that portion that goes for A and B, the portion that goes for A and C, and the portion that goes from B and C. But once I, when I've done that, I've subtracted out this entire spot where A, B, and C come together, so then I have to add that back in. So numerically, what that's going to look like, that's going to be the probability of A, 0.3, plus the probability of B, 0.6, probability of C, 0.4. Then I'm going to subtract to that the product of A and B, so 0.3 times 0.6, um, A and C, so that's going to be 0.3 times 0.4, B and C, 0.6 times 0.4, and then I'm again, I'm going to add the, um, the probability of all three of those things occurring, so that's going to be the product of A, B, and C. And when you crunch those numbers, you'll get 0.832, just like we got previously for De Morgan's rule. Okay? So that's the solution to the quiz questions. Uh, keep in mind that when we get to the final exam at the end of this course, a lot of the questions are going to be very similar, if not exactly the same. So it would be a good thing to 
review these quiz questions and make sure you have a good handle on uh, the solutions and how we do that. So, any questions on the module one quiz? And remember, we can just, you can ask questions directly over the phone or feel free to type any questions you might have into the uh, chat feature. All right, so if no one has any questions, we'll get out of this and we'll get into uh, the module two homework. All right, so in our module two homework, this is um, really our first opportunity to go through and actually calculate all the things that we're gonna calculate in a risk assessment. Our annual probability of failure, our average annual life loss, uh, we're going to make our uh, little fn plot and big fn plots using all this data. So we're told to dis discretize the stage frequency relationship into 10 even intervals and to include non-exceedance. We are also told to use semi-logarithmic interpolation for all our system response relationships. And then for exposure, we're also to assume an 11-hour workday. Okay. Uh, our project event tree is pretty simple and straightforward, which is given to us there, so we don't have to do anything um, special after we've calculated our um, system response probability. So, to start with, oops, messing around before we got on, forgot to clear that out. So, to start with, we've got a space for us to do our system response adjustment and to calculate our stage partition. So we're gonna start with our stage partitions. Again, we were told 10 even intervals. So our first input here is gonna be our lowest stage in the relationship, which is gonna be elevation 457. And then our highest is gonna be the highest stage in the relationship, which is 581.1, okay? We're told to do 10 intervals. So to get the um, second part of this first partition, I'm going to take the first stage, and then I'm going to add to it the difference between my max stage and my lowest stage, and then I'm going to divide by um, the number of partitions minus one. So I want 10 partitions, fact one, so that denominator is going to become a nine, and that's going to uh, give me the second part of this first partition. I'm going to go ahead and lock the cells for, um, in this part of the equation, my um, upper stage and my lowest stage, because I'm going to need that, and it'll be allow, allow me to drag that formula down to get the rest of my partitions. So I should get 470.8 as the um, second part of that partition. Okay, so then the next partition picks up where the other one left off. So we'll start with 470.8, and then I can drag that formula down because I'm gonna add the same um, number to the first partition. The spread is gonna be the same between all our stage ones and stage two. I should get 484.6. And then I can then highlight that, drag that down, to get the rest of my partitions. Again, if everything was done right, that last one right there in cell C73 should be equal to the highest stage. And we're reserving our uh, last partition for anything greater than that highest stage. Okay. So then next, we have what we need to start interpolating to get our marginal system response probabilities. So for PFM1 at the first partition, we're going to interpolate off of uh, this relationship right here. And we're told to use semi-log. So it's going to be linear for stage and then log for SRP. So the function I want to call is going to be lin log int. I want to figure out what the probability is for the midpoint of that partition. 
So I'm going to take the average of the two numbers that define that partition. And then I'm going to scroll up and select my X array, lock those columns. And then I'm going to get my Y array, which is the system response, lock those columns. Since everything is in ascending order, I'm going to choose a 1 for the next input. And since I do not want to extrapolate, I'm going to pick 0 for the last one. And when I do that, I should get 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6. So once that's set, because I've locked the uh, rows and columns for my X and Y array, I can drag that down and get the rest of my marginal system response probabilities. So then I'm going to repeat that step for the remain remaining failure modes. So again, it's going to be lin log int. I'm going to average the values for the stage partition. Now, this time I want PFM2, so I grab my X array, my Y array, one for ascending, zero to not extrapolate. And then I can drag those down. Um, another way to do this that's a little bit faster is to simply, I'm going to do this for PFM3. I'm going to copy the formula that I used for PFM2. And then I can simply drag these rectangles over to reference a different X and Y array. Works just the same as if I punched it in, but a lot faster. And then I can drag that down, and I'll do the same thing here for um, PSM4. If I'd been really smart, we could have, um, I was going to say you could have locked the averages here so you could dra drag that first formula over, but it's just as easy to copy and paste. Okay. So now that I've done that, I have all my uh, marginal system response probabilities, and I'm ready to do my common cause adjustment. I didn't give you space to calculate the complements. You could have done the complements out to the side if you wanted. I'm going to do this directly with doing the complements within the formula bar this time. So for De Morgan's rule, I'm going to take 1 minus the product of the complements. I'm going to take 1 minus the probability of PSM1 times 1 minus the probability of PSM2 times 1 minus the probability of PSM3 and 1 minus the probability of PSM4, okay? Now, to finish the common cause adjustment, I'm going to need to multiply all that by the probability of the failure mode that I'm looking at, which is going to be failure mode 1. So i got the marginal probability for PSM1, and I'm going to divide that by the sum of all of the marginal system response probabilities. And that will give me the adjusted system response for PFM1. Now, to leverage the equation that I just wrote, so that I don't have to type this out over and over again, I can um, lock the, the, I'm going to lock the columns associated with some of these. Really, everything in the De Morgan drill part, and then in the summation at the end of the equation. So I'm going to add dollar signs to lock the columns, but not the rows, because I'm going to want to be able to drag those down. So the dollar sign is going to go in front of the letter of each of these. I'm going to leave this part alone, because when I drag it over, I'm going to want it to reference PFM2, then 3, and then 4. Okay. If I've done that right, the adjustment won't make much difference, but I get I get 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6 again. We'll see a little bit of change, I think, when we get down to the uh, bottom of this table. Okay? So that should be set. I should be able to drag in the corner and drag it all over. Let's double check to make sure we're referencing things right. And for PSM4, it looks like we're good. I'm still using the same 
marginal probabilities in, in the De Morgan's rule calculation. But now I'm going to reference uh, PFM4 and then divide by the sum of all the marginals. So my first row is all set. Then I can take those, drag those all the way down to finish out the table. So as you see in this instance, because the probabilities aren't um, super big and aren't terribly close to each other, the, um, the amount that the probability is reduced by the adjustment is pretty minor. We go from 7.5 times 10 to the minus 5 down to 7.49 times 10 to the minus 5. So in this instance, whether we did the adjustment or not, probably wouldn't make too big a difference on our overall risk calculation, um, but that's not always the case. And it's um, especially when we start getting into some of the risk tools that are available to us, performing the adjustments, simple and easy, so we might as well do it. Okay. Any questions on that before moving on to the next step? Uh, yeah, Damon, this is Sheldon. Uh, so when I first read the problem, PM1 through one, two, three, four are all internal erosions. Uh, I thought mm -hmm. we needed to do the combination first, the same mechanism, different location combination, uh, as you talked about in the presentation. But I realized that's, that it wasn't necessary in this case. I guess the right. question is, when do we decide to do the combination worse than that? Right. I probably could have been a little more explicit about what these are. So in this particular example, what I was going for is, are these are four different internal erosion mechanisms. They're specific failure modes for different mechanisms. If these failure modes had been all the same mechanism, that's when we would have gone through and taken the max system response before doing the adjustment. So for example, if let's say um, PFM1 had been backward erosion piping and PFM2 had also been backward erosion piping, maybe this one was concentrated leak erosion and this one was um, internal migration. If that had been the case, I would have taken the maximum at each partition, or excuse me, uh, maximum for each stage for these two and combine those into one failure mode. And then I would have done a common cause adjustment between that one combined failure mode and these other two. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I guess, uh, would that make a difference on the inventory or can we tell from the inventory which ones, which, which ones should be combined versus not? Um, yeah, so in the event tree, there would have been um, only three branches where we would have had in that, how I had that prior um, makeshift example made up, one yeah. and two would have been a branch, and then three okay. and four would have been all. That's right. Uh, so that would be the telltale sign, I guess, uh, which one should be combined. Yeah. and. To be honest, I probably should have been more explicit in naming what those failure modes are to avoid that confusion. Um, I added um, the combination of failure modes from the last time we did this course to this time. I added that as part of the example and didn't think to make an adjustment here. So I apologize for any confusion. No, no, no problem. No problem. It's, it was a good I'll, exercise. Yes, for me. Very good. I, I appreciate the fact that you're thinking and that um, um, that you recognize that there could be the need to combine those. So good, good question. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's move on and let's get our calculations done now for um, PFM1. So in this, we've got our stages from before that was just copied down for us by the spreadsheet. So now we need our loading probability for each of those partitions. So to do that, I'm going to find the probability of um, having meeting or exceeding this first stage 
and then subtract from that the probability of meeting or exceeding the second stage. Now, this first input is a little bit different because we are told to include non-exceedance. So what that means is that my first probability here is going to essentially be a one. So I'm going to take one minus, and then I want the probability of um, meeting or exceeding this second stage. So that's going to be, anytime we're working with stage frequency, we want to use um, the varied interpolation. So it's going to be Lindsay int. I'm going to select my stage right here. Then I'll go up and get my X-array, which is going to be the peak stages, and then my Y-array, which is going to be the AEP. They're in ascending order, and I do not want to extrapolate. My first loading probability should be uh, 3.15 times 10 to the minus 1. So then for the next set, just to save some time, I'm going to go ahead and copy that formula. Actually, I'm just going to drag it down. But then I need to replace the one with um, the interpolated probability for um, that first stage. So I'm going to use Lindsay int, click that stage, and then go get my X ray again, my Y ray, and then finish out those inputs. I should get that right there. So again, what I'm doing is I'm interpolating to find the annual exceedance probability of the first stage of the partition, and then I'm going to subtract that from that the AEP of the second stage of the partition. That's going to give me the probability of having the loading between those two stages. So then once I have that, I can drag that down for everything but the last one. Now, the last one, I need the AEP of 581.1. I can drag that down, but then delete the front part, which will give me 4 times 10 to the minus 5. Or if I really, probably even simpler would have been just to go up here and read it straight off that table. Again, that last part in our tables, we're looking for the exceedance probability, something greater than or equal to um, 581.1, which we can read straight from the table. But either way, I get the same thing. Okay. If I've done this right, then I should be able to sum those up get a probability of 1. Ooh. Which I do. Okay. All right. So moving across in the table, next they ask for the exposure, and we were told to assume an 11-hour workday. The day exposure is going to be 11 divided by 24, since there's 24 hours in the day. And then night is going to be what's left over. So I can either take 1 minus the day exposure, or I could have done, what would that have been, 13 over 24 to get uh, 0.542. That's going to be the same for every partition, so I can drag those down. Next, I need the incremental life loss for CFM1. So the incremental life loss is going to be my breach life loss minus the non-breach life loss. So starting with the, um, for the daytime condition, so anytime we're doing uh, life loss, if we're doing stage, it's going to be linear interpolation. So I want lin int. I need it for the midpoint of the stage. And I'm going to take the average of those two values. Then I'm going to go find my day breach life loss. This is for PFMs 1 through 3. So my X array will be this right here. My Y array will be this guy right here. Those are in ascending order. I do not want to extrapolate. I should get 42.3 there. Now, 
that's just the breach life loss. To get the incremental, I need to subtract out the non-breach life loss. So the first input's gonna be the same, but now I need the X array for the non-breach life loss, and then the Y array for the just for the daytime. And subtracting those two values will give me the incremental life loss. In this case, those first stages are zero, so we're not gonna see any difference until we start getting above elevation 500. So with that set, I'm able to drag that all the way down and complete that part of the table. I'll re repeat that process for the night time. And like we did before, I'm gonna copy that entire equation over because that's gonna allow me, instead of typing things over, I can just drag the rectangles from day to night and I get a good relationship for night, which gives me 28.3. And then I can copy that down to get the rest. Any questions on that part before getting into our marginal risk and then the contribution to the total? Pretty straightforward, I think. All right, so then for our marginal risk, this is the risk due to PSM1 without any outside influence from other failure modes. So I wanna use the, the marginal system response that I um, interpolated from in the first step. So that's gonna be those values right there. So I'm just able to set this cell equal to that one and then drag those down. And that gives me the system response probabilities I need. The reason that works is because all these stage partitions are the exact same as the stage partitions that I use when I made my adjustments. So then to get my annual probability of failure, that is gonna be equal to the loading probability multiplied by my system response. So I will take the loading probability multiplied by the system response, and that'll give me the annual probability of failure for that stage partition. I can then take that formula and drag that down. Same for the others. And then we're set to do our average annual life loss. So my average annual life loss is going to be my exposure weighted day life loss plus the exposure weighted night life loss all multiplied by the APF. So I will take my day exposure and multiply by the day incremental life loss. I'll add to that our night exposure and the night incremental life loss, and then multiply that by the annual probability of failure for that partition. If I've done that correctly, I should get 1.64 times 10 to the minus five, and then drag that down. Okay. So then out to the side here, I've got the risk for just PSM1. So to get the totals, I'm going to sum the APF, marginal APF for PSM1. And then I'm gonna sum the average annual life loss for PSM1. And then my N bar, remember this is a weighted average, that's gonna be equal to the average annual life loss divided by the APF. So for PFM1, the values that you see there to the right, that's what I'm gonna plot in the little FN chart for PFM1. Now its contribution to the total is gonna be a little different because remember we had to do the common cause adjustment to account for um, our intersecting events to make sure that we're not double counting anything. So, the calculations for the contribution in the total are gonna be very similar to the marginal. The difference is now I'm gonna use the adjusted system response probabilities from the table above. But those are all gonna come for, at least for PFM1, they're gonna come from column H. So I'm gonna pull those probabilities down. 
And then my APF, again, is going to be the loading probability times the system response. And then my average annual life loss, just to save some typing time, is going to be the same as it was before with my exposure weighted day and night life loss, that sum. But instead of multiplying by the marginal APF, I'm going to multiply by this APF I calculated using the adjusted system response. And I'll get essentially the same thing, but it's going to, they're all going to be ever so slightly lower than what we um, calculated. You can't see it, but the decimal place would be just a little bit lower. So the difference of 3 times 10 to the minus 9 versus 2.998 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. So that gives me everything I need from PFM1. Um, the rest of the way, we are going to um, do the same set of calculations, but just using the inputs for PFM2. So this time, the system response I want is going to be, uh, for the marginal, I'm going to take the PFM2 probabilities from column E. APF is going to be the same as before or at least the equation is going to be the same as before. I take my loading probability and multiply by my system response. I can drag those down, and then the average annual life loss equation will be the same. And because these tables are laid out the same way, I can take that formula and just copy it straight down, and it will reference all the cells I need it to. Okay. And then... Same deal to get my totals. Again, I'll sum the APFs, marginal APFs for PFM2. Same thing for average annual life loss. And then N is going to be my average annual life loss divided by the APF. Uh, to get the contribution to the total, same calcs, just referencing the adjusted system response for PFM2. And again, because everything's set up the same way, I can take this take these equations from this table above it and multiply it below. I should get the correct equation. So for APF again, your loading probability minus or loading probability times your system response, and then your average annual life loss is going to be your exposure weighted day and night life loss added together times your APS. Okay. We'll do the exact same thing for PFM3. I'm going to go ahead and copy these formulas down and then grab the system response for PFM3. First one again is the marginal. The second one is going to be my common cause adjustment. And in fact, I can copy and paste these down as well. So this will give me the sum of my APFs, sum of my average annual life loss, and then average annual life loss divided by APF to get N bar. All right? So then for my last one, my last one is a little bit different because the consequences are different for PFM4. So I need to um, calculate the incremental life loss again. So for PFM4 for the daytime, again, we're going to use linear interpolation. I'm going to average the stage partitions, or average the elevations, I should say, that define the first partition. And we'll find our reach life loss up here. So the X-ray will be the peak stage. Day life loss will be the Y array. Ascending, not extrapolating. And then we'll use that same formula that reference the non breach table for the non breach life loss. So 
as you see, this one's a little different. It should be a lot lower. I get 4.1 for the daytime compared to 42.3 that we got for the other failure modes. So I've locked everything right, and it looks like I have. I can drag those down. And our maximum life loss is going to be upwards of 13. And then for the nighttime, I'm going to copy that formula over from the formula bar, paste it here, and then drag our X, excuse me, our Y array references over to the nighttime. And I get three for the night. Okay. And then lastly, we're set to do get our marginal PFM for risk and our contribution to the total. So we will find those system response probabilities, drag those down. And then again, I can just copy and paste these formulas down because they haven't changed. I, they just reference different cells now. So again, APF, loading probability times the system response, average annual life loss, your um, day life loss weighted by the exposure plus the night life loss weighted by the night exposure, that whole sum multiplied by the APF gives me the average annual life loss. Nothing changes over here. The only difference, nothing changes in the equation, except now I'm gonna use the um, common cause adjusted system response. Is there a question in there? It looks like I got a question in the chat. Uh, can I show the APF formula again? And yes, um, Gabriella's got it right. It's the loading probability multiplied by the um, system response probability. Loading probability, system response, that product is going to give the APF. Okay. So then, uh, last piece before I start getting my project totals, I need the total F APF for P4, which comes from the marginal part of the table. And then the um, same deal with the average annual life loss. And then N bar is the average annual life loss divided by the APF. All right. Any questions on any of that before we get into the last piece of the little FN chart? All right. So then to get my uh, the spreadsheet set up, so it's already plotting the mod marginal risk for PFM 1, 2, 3, and 4. We just need another set of inputs to get our total. So getting our total APF, we're going to sum all the APF contributions from, looks like it's going to be column M, from all the different failure modes. So that's going to be equal to the sum of all the common cause adjusted PM, uh, APS from PFM1 plus some of all of them from PFM2, 3, and 4. When I do that, I should get 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the average annual life loss. Again, that's the average annual life loss with adjustment for PFM1 plus that of PFM2, PFM2 plus that of PFM3, and lastly, PFM4. That should get 8.91 times 10 to the minus 3. And then my N bar is going to be the average annual life loss divided by the yes. 43, and my total risk should plot right there. You'll see that it, it tracks mostly with the APF of PFM3, but it's a little higher because I'm getting contributions from these other failure modes. Um, because 
PFM3 has more than an order of magnitude risk than the next highest, the total pretty much is going to track on the same diagonal as PFM3. All right, so I have, looking at the chat, um, I got the question, can I show the formula for the loading probability one more time? Sure thing. So for the loading probability, in this first partition here, I'm going to take one minus the annual exceedance probability for this elevation for the second stage, so 470.8. To get that AEP, I'm going to use Z variate interpolation. So that's going to be lin Z int. I'm going to select that stage. And then my X array is going to be the peak stage. And then the Y array is going to be the AEP. The reason I have a 1 in the first part of this equation is because we're told to use non exceedance. So anytime we're using non exceedance, that the uh, probability of the first stage is always going to be equal to one. Okay. The other way to have done that would have been, I could have just as easily taken the AEP of five, um, that corresponds to an elevation of 457, subtract from that the AEP uh, that corresponds to 470.8, but then add to that, one minus the AEP of elevation um, 457. It's going to get you exactly the same thing as what I'm showing here for this first one. So then for the second and the really the all but the last input, again, I'm going to interpolate to get the AEP for the elevation that defines the first stage, and then I'm going to subtract from that the elevation that defines the second stage. When I do that, and that gives me the probability of being exactly in between those two elevations. Okay? So that formula basically stays the same for each of these other inputs. We're just using the different elevations that define the different partitions. Then for the last one, I'm looking for the probability of exceeding elevation 581.1. So I can interpolate to find that, or because that elevation is already in our I can just read it off. That's 4 times 10 to the minus 5. So if I've done all that correctly, then sum should equal 1. Okay? So for I forget who had that question. Did, did that answer things for you? Is that clear enough? If not, we can come back to it. Very good. Awesome. Okay. So with that, we've got our little FN chart, and our last piece is going to be to create our big FN chart. So each of our FN, we're going to have to have an FN pair for every different um, partition and exposure scenario. So I'm going to have a set for the daytime for PFM1 and the nighttime for PFM1. Day and night for PFM2, day and night for PFM3, and then day and night for PFM4. So the first input is going to be the APS that I calculated for the first partition from PFM1. And when we're making the big FN chart, we need the common cause adjusted APS. So we're going to pull from column M, which is going to be our contribution to the total. And when we're done, and we've summed up all of our FN pairs to make that cumulative plot, that final F, big F, should be the same as our total APF for the project, okay? So this first input is going to come from cell M82. And I'm going to take that. All these partitions are the same as we had above, so I'm going to be able to drag that down. And that's going to pull the APFs for 
PFM1. Um, the dam doesn't really care if it's day or night, so the APS is going to be the same for both day and night. So I can now reference above and pull those down. I'm going to go ahead and repeat that um, for the other failure modes to complete the table. So I'm going to go grab the common cause adjusted APF or PFM2, drag those down, and set the night equal to the day, drag that down, and then do the same thing for PFM3. So I'm grabbing the common cause adjusted APF or PFM3, drag that, finish out the day, set, those, set the day equal to the night, Drag those down, and then lastly, we'll do the same thing for PFM4. Now, if we pulled all the right cells, because we have the same APF for day and night, if I sum these, I'm going to get twice the APF. I mean, this is a a simple check. So if I do this, I get 411 times 10 to the minus 4. I divide that number by 2. I should get the total APF that I had prior. So that was 2.05 10 to the minus 4. It looks like I pulled in everything right because I'm getting the same thing there. Okay. So next, we need to pull in our exposures. So I need our day exposure for all of the daytime scenarios, and then the night exposure for nighttime scenarios. So we can pull from the table above, any of these tables above, because they're all the same, or we can just calculate it. I think it's going to be easier to just calculate it again. It's 11 over 24. That way, I can drag that all the way down, and then take um, the complement of that, 13 over 24, and drag those all the way down for day and night. And then once that's set, I can copy and paste those all down because I'm not referencing any cells. I just did the computation directly. So that'll be the same for PFM2, PFM3, and PFM4. Okay? So then to get my little s, so I can start making my FN pairs, that is going to be the product of the APF and the exposure that we just calculated. And that formula is going to be the same for the rest, all the way down to the bottom of the table. So I can copy and paste those down. Again, if I've done that right, similar to before, if I take the sum of all of these, now I've got the exposures in there, I should get the total failure probability that I calculated and plotted on the little FN chart, which I do. 2.05 times 10 to the minus 4. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so next, I need the um, incremental life loss that corresponds to each of these different failure modes. So I need to pull in the day life loss for PFM1, then the night life loss for PFM1, and then so on and so forth for the other failure modes. So I can pull those directly from the tables yes. above. So my day life loss will be, so the first partition is 42.3. So I can select that cell. Drag that down. Then I'll do the same thing for the night. Drag those down. And then I'll repeat that for PFM2. That just so happens to be the same as PFM1, but we'll reference the right table. Then the night. PFM3, the 
day and PSM3 for the night. And then PSM4 had the different life loss. We definitely need to pull from here. I got my day and now the night to finish out that part of the table. And that gives me all of my FN pairs that I'm going to need to then sort to make the big FN chart. So before I do that, are there any questions on anything I just did to fill out uh, this table over here? Okay, so this next part, there's a couple different ways to pull this data over and um, get it organized. Um, the easiest is going to be to paste the values and sort like I asked you to do here. Um, if you're pretty good with Excel, you can also use um, the rank feature to rank your end values and then um, sort by your rankings instead, you know, using lookups. The advantage to that is if you use rank and then um, lookup tables, if data changes, like let's say you wanted to change your system response or your consequence inputs, it would automatically change that so that you wouldn't have to redo the operation that we're just about to do. So when we get to um, module four and module five and stuff like that, that's basically what it's doing under the hood and why you don't have to manually do this. But if you were to do it manually, we'll start by taking our life loss values from here and we're going to copy and paste them into this next table as values. So to do that, we'll press this little down arrow underneath paste, and then we're going to select values, the clipboard with the one, two, three in the, to the left. Okay? That is pasted those as values. They're no longer referenced to anything else. So then I'm going to do the same thing with my little S. I'm going to paste these values. So now that I have those set, I'm then going to sort those values by N. And I want the largest N first. I'm going to highlight these two columns and go up to Data and click Sort. It's going to ask me what I want to sort by. I want to sort by the N value and I want to sort them from largest to smallest. So when I do that, my first N should be my highest N, which is 88. And there's a few of those. Okay. So then to get my big S, I need to um, take the little S and then sum the next little S below it, or I guess above it, sorry. So this first one, Big S is going to be equal to little s, which is 1.37 times 10 to the minus 9. For the next one, I'm going to take the big S I just calculated and sum to it the, the next little s, and then so on and so forth. So I can take that formula and drag that all the way down. And if I've done everything right, that final big S should be equal to the total APF that I calculated earlier, 2.05 times 10 to the um, minus four. Um, question in the chat asks, is it a coincidence that I have three values for N that are always the same? In this example, yes. The reason I have three that are the same is because I had three different failure modes with exactly the same life loss. So if those life loss estimates had been different, then I would not have had three of the same. And a lot of times, you know, if the breach parameters are going to be similar between multiple failure modes and our um, ability to observe and get warnings out are all similar, you know, it, it's not uncommon for um, failure modes that are of different internal erosion mechanisms to have or to be represented by the same consequence estimates. 
That's why those are the same. But like I said, that won't always be the case. Only when you get down, so it's like if you're following in this table, you know, well, I, I'm not sure which is which, but one of these is for PFM1, one, one is for two, and one is for three. Then when we get down here, PFM4 life loss is so much lower, that's why those are showing up kind of more down at the bottom. Okay. So once I've done that, we've technically we're supposed to plot it stepwise. If you've got enough partitions, it really doesn't matter. And that's what's being plotted here. Um, the only thing that we would need to do to, to finish this out would be to extend this over. Um, the best way to do that would be to add um, one more FN pair. We'll take the same total APF that we just calculated, but then we want that line to go all the way over. So we would choose a um, one or something less than one would work. And then we can tweak the inputs. Instead of going down to 275, we can make it go down to 276 instead. And that's what it would look like. If we had wanted to plot it stepwise, then the um, first two n, n values would then correspond to the first big F. The second and third n value would then correspond to the second big F. So I guess let's go ahead and do that because we can. Let's. So we, we would take all of the oops, all of the n values that we had prior, copy those, paste those down here, and then I'm going to take the big S and do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and plot them right next to each other just to make life a little easier. Okay. So this is again n. And this is big S. And I'm going to go ahead and assign these an odd number, okay? One, three, five, seven, nine, all the way down. Just to plot stepwise, I'm going to need a second set in between those. So to plot stepwise, remember this in the first set, it's going to go, I think the first ends go with the first probability. So I'm going to go down an N, calculate and copy the rest of the table, at least down to three. We'll paste that there. This value is fine. And then I'm going to take the first S and go all the way down and copy that. And paste that there. I want one too many, but that's okay. Delete it. Okay. And then I'm going to assign those an even number so that I can sort those, get them in the order that I want. So now I take that whole big data set that I just created, and I'm going to sort them from, I don't, I'm going to say that I don't have header rows. So I'm going to sort by column H. I'm going to go smallest to largest. So what that's done, now I've got the big F. The first two ends with the first big F. And the next one will be the second two ends with the second big F. Next two ends with the second big F. So on and so forth. If I plot that on top of here, I will plot X is going to be my N value, and Y is going to be my, my big S. If I've done this right, it should plot directly over what we had there. And as you can tell, it really, unless you really, really zoom in, you can't tell much difference in what implying it stepwise versus um, not stepwise. Really, the only thing instead of having, you know, the smooth, you know, the straight steps when done properly, you'll have a slight angle between those and the line. So, 
technically the correct way is to do it stepwise, but if you have enough partitions visually, you won't be able to see the difference, and it's not always worth your time. Let's put it that way. Um, looking at the chat, looks like there's a question. Could you review again the simple check for APS values and big S? Sure. So again, the big S that I calculate at the end, this one right here, this one should be equal to the total APS that I calculated for my little fn chart. That's going to be the same as the sum of all the little f that I calculated here. It's also that same number, which is going to be the same as the sum of the APS here, but divided by 2 because I've got the APF for the day, which is going to be the same as the APF for the night. I get that same value. Okay. All right. So that was the solution for homework number two. Is there any other questions on this one? The question is asked for the APS, average annual life loss, and NBAR calculations for each failure mode. Why are the marginal values used instead of the adjusted values? The reason they are is because we don't we want to give a true represent true representation of the risk associated with that failure mode. If we plot the contribution to the total for each of those failure modes, let's say I were to fix PFM three. Well, once I fix PFM three, that's going to cause the risk of PFM one, two, and four to increase because I no longer have that intersection probability. Does that make sense? So the more failure modes I have, the less the contribution to the total is going to be because of those intersections. So we always are going to plot the marginal risk for each of the failure modes. So that's basically an unbiased look for each of these failure modes. But then when we complete, compute the total, we don't want to overcount the intersection, so we're going to use the adjusted values to do that. Um, this is also um, a nod to, um, you know, I'm blanking on what it's called, back in module one. Give me one second. There it is, sorry. Unimodal bounds theorem. So this is a nod to that. So when we've got unimodal bounds theorem, it's basically saying that probability of failure is going to be somewhere between the highest failure mode and our um, total things this way. We've got our marginal risk for each failure mode and then the adjusted common cause adjusted total. Does, does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Very good. In, in this particular example, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference because um, PFM3 is so much greater than PFM4, which is so much greater than PFM1. But if, for example, we had had, you know, a handful of failure modes that had higher probabilities and they were all three plotting together, like somewhere up in here, that common cause adjustment would make a much bigger difference. So if we had plotted the contribution to the total instead, it would make it look like the risk of those three failure modes were less than it really was. And fixing one of them would cause the other two to increase. All right, next question. Does I lost Joe when plotting stepwise? Sorry, can I go back over that? Yeah, okay. So to plot stepwise, all I'm doing is I'm taking these first two n values and assigning it the same big F right here. Okay? Then I'm going to do the I'm going to move down and do the same thing. I'm going to take these next two n values 
and assign it this big S. And then these two N values and assign it this big S. Okay? On down, so on, so forth. So to do that, I can copy and what I was doing was I copied and pasted this whole relationship where this N corresponds to this F. I copied and pasted that down below. In fact, we can, let's go ahead and redo it. Oops. So I'm copying and pasting all these N's down Oops, it's floppy. Let's try it again. All right, so I've copied that, and I'm going to paste that as a value. I'm going to do the same thing with the big S. Copy and paste those down. Now, the values that I have here correspond to this part in the blue ones, so the first N and the first S. And it corresponds to the first N and the first F of the second one, and the first F, or the first N and the first F of the third one. They're in green. Okay? So now I need the other part. I need the second N to line up with the first F. So I'm going to, instead of copying from the top now, I'm going to go one down. I'm going to start in cell I97, and I'm going to copy those values. And paste those down below. I'm going to make a mark here because I'm going to have to number those. So then I want that second N to correspond to the first F. The third N to correspond to the second F. Fourth to the third, so on and so forth. So now I'm going to take this first S and go all the way down everything but the last one. Copy that and paste that there. Okay. So now I have all the pieces to plot stepwise, but they're all out of order. If I tried to plot it like this, it will look pretty funky, like something like that where everything's jumping around, okay? So to get around that and to sort things correctly, I'm going to assign that first set of values odd numbers. One, three, five, seven, nine, so on and so forth, and drag that down. Too far. And then I'm going to assign the second set even values. Well, now what I have when I sort these, I've got the first N with the first APS. Then I'm going to have the second N with the first APS. I'll have the second N with the second APS. And by APS, I mean big F, sorry. Second N, second big F. And then I'm going to have what is the third N with the second big S, okay? So then I can sort all that together using those numbers that I put out to the side here, and that'll get everything in order for me. So I'm going to sort column H from smallest to largest. Now let's bring up another uh, window so you can help see this. So again, now I've got the first N with the first big F and the second N with the first big F. I've got the second N with the second big F, third N, second big F, third N, third big F. Now you'll see the difference now, the fourth N with the third big F, so on and so forth. Okay, 
And then when I do that, that cleans up my plotting. Does that make sense now, Shelby? Good. Uh, the good news is, after this, unless you really want to, you're probably never going to have to plot that stepwise by hand ever again unless you make some kind of custom spreadsheet. All the spreadsheet tools and RMC total risk and things like that, they're all set up to do all that stuff for us. So it's really just to know what the program's doing. So be fortunate that we don't have to do that ever again. Okay. Any other questions? Cool. Um, if there's no other questions, um, now's probably a good time to give you the buzzword. The buzz, oh, there you go, Brian. The buzzword for this um, module is going to be intervals. Intervals, as in age frequency intervals. Okay. That will be the first question on quiz. And just as a refresher, again, the quizzes are going to be on Socrative. We'll go to Socrative.com. You'll click student login, just like we did for the um, first quiz. The only difference is the room name is now going to be uh, DLS 105 R2 for module two. There's separate rooms for each thing. And in your name, last name, first name, and then you should be all set. And the buzzword is intervals. Okay. A um, couple other things that might be useful to you. So if you go to the website and the spot for this training course, we've got some other things that have been uploaded recently that's supplemental and might be helpful. So under DLS 105, we have a video added now for um, a seismic structural example. Let me get this pulled up. Yeah. So what we did in homework um, two, that's going to be how you do things for a, a simple um, uh, hydrologic set of failure modes. Again, once you start having seismic failure modes, all of those columns now become matrices. The, the process is similar, but it's more, I guess, computationally intense, if you will. Also, when you start dealing with um, gates and earthquakes, um, you can have different breach scenarios for, you know, the same failure mode, whether I get a one-gate breach, or a two-gate breach, or a three-gate breach. So this supplemental presentation goes through a much more complicated example where you know, we have a large earthquake and we can have different things that can fail, like a pier, the gate itself, an end anchorage. And they all have different, um, different consequences and breach outcomes. So that'll step through all the different ways to create those equations and use event trees to do that. Um, it's completely optional. It's recommended. I think it's a it, it's about a 40-minute presentation, but again, it's an optional example to step through on your own time if you want or to come back to it at a later time if you have a seismic failure mode that you want to look at. So that's for, I guess, um, your own personal learning experience if you want to go through it. Um, also, with that, there are, similar to the example that we had in Module 2, there are companion um, files that go with it. So we've got the supplemental presentation, and then you've got the seismic structural example exercise. So there's a spreadsheet set up for you where if you want to, you can follow along with the video to get you some more hands-on learning. Okay, any questions on that one? And then for um, Module 3, all of the, the videos and the files associated with Module 3 have all been posted just like we've been doing before. 
Um, as a reminder, you are going to need to have um, at risk to fully do all the exercises and stuff. Um, if you don't have at risk, I have created homework files that will give you the feel of at risk without using at risk, if that makes any sense. In fact, let's go ahead and download one of those and open it, and I'll show you um, what I mean by that. Um, if you have admin rights to your computer, there's always the option to um, download the free trial that um, they have on their website. The instructions are in the course manual for that. If you go that route, please wait until wait a couple weeks, wait until the 21st of March to download that because the free trial has like a, um, a two week limitation. Module three and module four. So if you wait till the 21st, that gives you, you know, a week towards the tail end of the module three window to do the module three stuff. And then it gives you the first week in the module four window to do the module four stuff. But I'll send, we'll have a email sent out to remind you that if you're going to go that route, um, that would be the time to download those. Um, so let's go find that file that just, we just downloaded. So I just downloaded the module three homework. It'll say no at risk if you uh, don't have at risk. For um, those of you in the core to get macros to work, anytime you download something from the internet, ACE it will block it. So if you right click, go to properties, you can click unblock and apply. And then we'll open this guy up. So it's all set to do the stuff, but instead of having at risk running, You'll type in the formula, like for this one, it's going to be risk triang, low, most likely, and high. If I've done it right, it will return the mean value for that formula. If I do it wrong, say D19 twice, I'll get an error. So it's a way to practice without actually having the, the program. It's not perfect, but again, it's the best I could do if, if you can't get that installed. I didn't want um, your inability to get a fairly expensive program to keep you from participating in the rest of the course. And in fact, the last few times we've offered this, a lot of people would get to this part, have trouble getting that risk on their computer, and then just lose all momentum and kind of give up, and I don't want that to happen. So we've created these spreadsheets to help you in that regard. Just keep in mind, these are all text, so in reality, you'd be able to drag these, but you can't because it's going to just drag the same text over and not change the columns and rows. So these were, you'll have to type those in by hand on your own if you go that route. Okay, that makes sense. So that's the um, no at risk version. There is also a, um, with at risk version out there. That's the one that just says exercises and homework. Okay. Any questions on anything related to um, the module two quiz, the um, supplemental example, or uh, the module Free files. So the question in the chat is I'd like to clarify that we can use the non at risk spreadsheet to do the homework. Correct. Yes, you can. That's its sole purpose. Um, the exercises are not set up in there for you to do. If you don't have at risk, you'll kind of have to just watch and follow along. But the homework, yes, is set up for you to use that spreadsheet. Yes. Uh, there's a question, is there a specific license for at-risk for core users? So there kind of is. So if you go through, when you go through the app portal, 
there's going to be two different options for downloading at risk. There's going to be one with a standalone license, and then there's going to be one to use the server license. You're going to want to download the one with a server license. And those server licenses come from the RMC. I don't remember how many of them there are. There's not a whole lot. Um, so if you go that route, um, I would prefer that you try to do um, your homework assignments or to use at risk on non-peak hours so the people doing risk assessment have those available to them. Um, but yes, there, there is a, a license. In the past, I, for whatever reason, ACID has had all kinds of trouble getting at risk on people's computers. I'm not sure what the issue is, but um, let's just say no promises if you go that route that ACID will be able to get it fixed and able to work for you. I'm sorry, there's not a better solution, but um, hopefully you get a good um, get a good tech that knows what they're doing. If you try to go that route and it doesn't work, let me know. And I can see there's some other um, people on the RMC side that are experts in how to, I guess, update the registry and do things to try to make that work. So I might be able to help you out. Very good. If there's nothing else, then this is going to be a wrap for the Module 2 live session. As always, as you start going through the exercises and the homework, if you've got um, questions or run into any trouble, feel free to send an email asking for help, or in a couple weeks we'll have the uh, office hours, and you can ask your question in person there. So thank you guys for attending. Thanks for your time. Um, this video will be uploaded here within the next day or two to the website, and we'll catch you again for Module 3. Thanks, everybody.